While Greenland has been in the news for a possible forced annexation by the USA, there's more you need to know about Greenland's people, whose voices are often ignored in geopolitical discussions. The story of Greenland's Inuit population is one of resilience overshadowed by centuries of foreign domination. Danish colonial policies, which began in 1721 when Denmark claimed Greenland, inflicted profound harm on the identity and traditions of the Inuit. Their way of life, deeply rooted in harmony with nature and spiritual practices, faced deliberate suppression. The arrival of Christianity in Greenland reshaped indigenous spiritual practices. Missionaries viewed shamanism and animism as pagan and sought to replace them with Christian teachings. This cultural imposition decimated spiritual traditions and left lasting scars on Inuit identity, forcing them to adapt in ways that often meant abandoning their rich heritage. Language, the backbone of any culture, was another front in this campaign of suppression. Inuit children were forcibly taken from their families and sent to boarding schools where instruction was exclusively in Danish. This intentional marginalization of Kala Alisut, the Inuit language, fractured cultural continuity, leaving many generations unable to fully connect with their heritage. One of the most infamous examples of this is the Little Danes experiment, conducted in 1951 where 22 Inuit children were sent to Denmark under the guise of receiving better education and welfare. The experiment was a 1951 Danish operation designed to re-educate 22 Greenlandic Inuit children. The children were supposed to be orphans, but only six were actually without parents. The experiment was part of a scheme to create a new ruling class of Greenlanders who would bridge Danish and indigenous cultures. The children were selected by Greenlandic priests according to specific criteria. They were to be around six years old, without mental or physical impairments, and orphaned. However, due to the lack of qualifying children, the criteria were not strictly followed, and many children with families were included. In May 1951, the MS Disco departed Nuuk, carrying the 22 Greenlandic Inuit children, 13 boys and 9 girls. Upon arrival in Copenhagen, they were placed in a holiday camp at Fed Garden, operated by Save the Children where they were immediately quarantined over fears they carried contagious diseases. This quarantine lasted the entire summer, during which one of the children, Helene Thiessen, developed eczema. The children were then placed in Danish foster families for over a year, where they learned the Danish language and forgot their native Kalalisut. They were supposed to be sent back to Nuuk after about six months, but the construction of the orphanage stalled, extending their stay in Denmark. During this period, six of the children were adopted by Danish families, while the rest returned to Greenland. Sixteen children returned to Greenland, only to be placed in Danish-speaking orphanages. None of them were allowed to live with their families again, and even if they could, they could no longer speak the same language as their families. The policy in these orphanages was to speak only Danish, further distancing the children from their cultural heritage. The long-term effects of the experiment were devastating. Half of the children experienced mental health disturbances, substance abuse, and suicide attempts over the course of their lives, and half died in young adulthood. The children struggled with cultural isolation and social alienation, losing their sense of purpose in life. In 2020, the Danish government officially apologised for the Little Danes experiment, acknowledging the unbearable human consequences it had on the children involved. Danish Prime Minister Mette Frederiksen met with the six surviving members of the experiment and apologised on behalf of Denmark. The survivors have sought compensation for the trauma they endured. Despite the apology and efforts towards reconciliation, challenges persist. The forced removal of Inuit children from their families continues to be a contentious issue, with reports indicating that Inuit children are disproportionately placed in foster care in Denmark. The use of culturally inappropriate parenting tests has been criticised for unfairly targeting Inuit families and perpetuating systemic inequalities. The treatment of Inuit children in Greenland by the Danish authorities is a painful reminder of the destructive nature of forced assimilation. The Little Danes experiment stands as a symbol of the broader policies aimed at erasing Inuit culture and identity. These re-education policies weren't simply about schooling, they were about controlling how the Inuit viewed themselves and their lives. The pain deepened in the mid-20th century, as Danish policies uprooted entire Inuit communities. Families were relocated from their ancestral hunting grounds to urban housing projects under the guise of modernization. Far from their traditional lands, these communities struggled to adapt to a lifestyle that severed their spiritual and economic connection to the Arctic. The establishment of the Thule Air Base by the United States during the Cold War 
added another layer of displacement. Whole communities were evicted, sacrificing their lives to strategic interests that they had never consented to. Beyond land, even the Inuit's lifeblood, their reliance on seal and whale hunting came under attack. Denmark and international environmental groups introduced hunting bans, devastating their subsistence economy. These policies, often shaped without Inuit consultation, condemned a people who'd sustainably lived off Arctic resources for millennia. The painful history of foreign rule remains etched into Greenland's fabric. The story of Greenland's earliest inhabitants is as astonishing as the harsh Arctic landscapes they called home. Around 4,500 years ago, the first Paleo-Eskimos arrived on Greenland's shores during the Arctic's pre-Dorset period. These were not descendants of modern Inuit, but an entirely distinct migratory wave from Siberia, bearing no genetic ties to subsequent populations that would make Greenland their home. DNA analysis of ancient remains has shed light on the origins of these pioneering people. Paleo-Eskimos carried unique genetic signatures, marking them as separate from later groups, such as the Thule culture Inuit, who arrived thousands of years later. This distinction underscores how Greenland was a nexus through which various waves of human migration interacted with one of the most challenging environments on Earth. Modern Greenlanders, however, are not direct descendants of those original settlers. The Thule culture replaced the Paleo-Eskimos around 1,000 years ago, carrying with them advanced hunting tools and practices that allowed them to thrive in the Arctic. Thule ancestors of the modern Inuit eventually mixed with the Danish settlers, leaving Greenlanders today with a complex genetic story that captures centuries of survival, migration, and adaptation. Mitochondrial DNA in Greenlanders today often includes haplogroups A2, A2A, and D4, which link them to both Native American and Inuit populations. Meanwhile, the Y chromosomes analyzed from paternal lineages prominently feature haplogroup Q1A, tracing back to Siberia. Interestingly, there are also traces of haplogroup R1b, a distinctly European lineage, introduced during Denmark's colonial era. From Paleo-Eskimos braving Arctic winters with no modern tools to contemporary Greenlanders navigating a blend of Inuit and European heritage, it reveals a rich and layered history. The intertwining genetic legacies testify to how both ancient and modern populations adapted to one of the most unforgiving yet remarkable ecosystems on Earth. Language is more than just a means of communication. For the Inuit people of Greenland, it is a living thread that ties their culture, identity, and history together. At the heart of this cultural preservation is Kalalisut, the official language of Greenland and the most widely spoken dialect. As part of the Eskimo Aleut language family, Kalalisut connects its speakers not only within Greenland, but also with Inuit communities across the Arctic regions of Canada and Alaska. Kalalisut holds immense cultural significance. Through its words, phrases, and expressions, it conveys the Inuit worldview, traditions, and intimate knowledge of the natural environment. For instance, the rich vocabulary for snow, ice, and hunting practices reflects not only the harsh Arctic landscape, but also the deep connection between the Inuit way of life and the environment that sustains it. Alongside Kalalisut, dialects such as Tunumit, Orasiat, East Greenlandic, and Inuktun, North Greenlandic, carry unique regional identities, further enriching Greenland's linguistic landscape. The historical influence of Danish during colonization introduced pressures on Greenlandic languages. Greenland's Inuit spirituality is deeply entwined with the natural world, shaped by their environment and survival against Arctic extremes. Traditional beliefs revolved around animism, the understanding that every aspect of the natural world, from animals to weather patterns, even seemingly inanimate objects like rocks or ice, is imbued with a spirit. This worldview fostered a profound reverence for the environment, as every decision carried spiritual consequences. Central to this spiritual framework were the shamans, or angakoks, who served as mediators between the human world and the spirits. Their role was vital, encompassing healing, divination, and maintaining balance between people and the forces of nature. Through chants, rituals, and rhythmic drum dances, angakoks sought guidance from spirits, particularly in times of illness or environmental hardship. One of the most significant figures in Inuit mythology is Sedna, the sea goddess. According to legends, Sedna controls all marine life, holding the fate of hunters in her grasp. If balance between humans and nature was disrupted, for example through overhunting or failing to honor the spirits properly, Sedna would withhold fish, seals, and other essential resources. Angakuks often traveled to the spirit world to appeal to her, 
demonstrating the interconnectedness between spiritual reverence and survival. This intricate spiritual system faced near extinction with the arrival of Danish colonists in the 18th century. Yet many straddled two worlds, blending elements of ancestral spirituality with Christianity, a testament to their resilience. The art of Greenland's Inuit population is a profound expression of their identity, rooted in the harsh yet beautiful Arctic environment that has shaped their culture. Traditionally, Inuit art was deeply functional and spiritual, utilising readily available materials such as soapstone, bone, ivory and wood. These were not merely items of utility but vessels of storytelling and cultural memory, reflecting the intimate relationship between the Inuit and their environment. Like most things, much of the traditional Inuit art focuses on themes tied to survival and spirituality. Animals such as whales, seals and polar bears, which were central to Inuit life, often appear in carvings and sculptures. These representations were not just artistic but deeply symbolic, serving to honour the animal's spirits and to ensure future hunting success. One of the most striking aspects of Inuit art is the creation of masks. These masks, frequently featured in shamanic rituals, carried immense spiritual significance. Crafted with intricate detail, they were designed to represent spirits or ancestors and were integral to ceremonies meant to communicate with the unseen world. The masks often displayed exaggerated, otherworldly features, embodying the visions and spiritual journeys undertaken by shamans during their mediations. With the onset of Danish colonial influence, traditional art began to evolve, as Inuit artists encountered European techniques and tools. However, Inuit art retained its distinctive themes and identity, blending old and new to create something uniquely resilient. For thousands of years, Greenland's Inuit have relied on ingenious clothing designs to survive the Arctic's brutal conditions, where temperatures can plummet far below freezing and icy winds threaten to strip away body heat. Each garment, crafted with precision and purpose, is a testament to their resourcefulness and deep understanding of the environment. Seal and caribou skin were the primary materials for traditional clothing, prized for their insulation and durability. Central to Inuit attire was the anorak, a hooded parka that varied in design for men and women. Men's anoraks were optimised for hunting, offering mobility and wind protection, while women's designs included a larger hood, known as a namout, for carrying infants. This innovative feature allowed mothers to keep their children safe and warm, directly against their bodies while navigating the Arctic. Footwear was equally vital. Kamiks, boots made from seal or reindeer skin, were lightweight, durable and waterproofed with animal fat. Insulated with grass or fur, they protected feet from frostbite, even during prolonged exposure to ice and snow. Beyond functionality, Inuit clothing held cultural significance. Women's ceremonial wear, known as kalalisut, featured vibrant beaded tunics and intricately embroidered pants. These colourful outfits, often worn during weddings or national celebrations, reflected Greenland's artistic traditions and sense of identity. Today, while modern materials like Gore-Tex and synthetic insulation have supplemented traditional garments, the craftsmanship of Inuit clothing remains celebrated. Greenland's Inuit society has long been defined by its intricate web of family and community relationships, rooted in collaboration and survival. At its core, the family unit extended well beyond parents and children, encompassing aunts, uncles, grandparents, and even distant relatives. This interconnected structure ensured that everyone contributed to the well-being of the group, fostering a sense of collective responsibility. Historically, Inuit families were nomadic, following the migration patterns of animals like seals, whales, and caribou. This mobility was essential in the Arctic, where resources were scarce and weather patterns unpredictable. Extended families often formed tightly knit groups that travelled together, sharing the demands of hunting, cooking and caring for children. The ability to adapt quickly to challenges was crucial, and this adaptability was embedded in Inuit social structure. Communal hunting and food sharing played vital roles in sustaining these groups. Successful hunters distributed their catch among families to ensure no one went without, regardless of their immediate contributions. Child rearing was another highly cooperative effort. Stories, songs and oral traditions were integral to this process, passing vital knowledge from one generation to the next within an intimate setting. The Inuit's expertise in navigating the Arctic waters is showcased through their innovative use of kayaks and umiaks. Kayaks, slender, one-person vessels, made from driftwood and seal skin, were used primarily for hunting. 
Their aerodynamic design allowed hunters to glide silently across icy waters, sneaking up on prey undetected. Larger communal umiaks, also built from similar materials, were essential for transporting families and their catches during seasonal migrations. Traditional tools like harpoons were vital for Arctic hunting. Crafted with precision, harpoon heads were often made from bone, ivory or metal, designed to pierce thick hides and remain embedded. These weapons were not only efficient but were often decorated with carvings, reflecting the artistry of Inuit craftsmanship. Though modernization has introduced new techniques and tools, traditional Inuit hunting and fishing methods remain a vital part of their cultural identity. Greenland has produced several notable figures who have made significant contributions in various fields. Knud Rasmussen, often called the father of Eskimology, was a pioneering polar explorer and anthropologist who documented Inuit culture and traditions, leaving a lasting legacy in Arctic studies. Nuka'aka Koster Waldau, a Greenlandic singer, actress, and former Miss Greenland, has gained recognition for her artistic talents and her role in promoting Greenlandic culture on a global stage. Another prominent figure is Alika Hammond, who made history as Greenland's first female prime minister, serving from 2013 to 2014, and played a key role in advocating for Greenland's autonomy and development. Despite being a small population, their unique cultural identity, rich heritage, and connection to their land deserve profound respect. Greenland's people must not be seen as a mere strategic asset, but as a sovereign community with voices that need to be genuinely heard and valued in the global arena. Their autonomy is non-negotiable, and should remain a testament to the resilience and dignity of their nation.